So first of all, welcome to the course. Uh, thanks for signing up. Uh, if you're watching this live today, uh, thank you. And if you're watching this in the Andor Learning Center, then uh, you can go ahead and binge all four episodes of this. There's going to be four presentations. Today, the basic physics of spectroscopy, or at least some basic physics of spectroscopy. Day two is going to be more about applied practice. Day three is going to be about specifically the equipment for optical spectroscopy. And day four will be about pushing the limits, which is uh, extreme optical spectroscopy measurements. I think at the end of this presentation, I'll talk a little bit more about what each of those subsequent three presentations will be about. So if you're very new to spectroscopy, great, this is going to be fun. It'll be a, a very quick introduction. And I'll explain in a minute again the limitations of this very short four-part course. And if you're for others, I mean, if you've been doing this for a while, maybe you'll get a new perspective. Uh, alternatively, you might get real bored and turn it off, and that's totally okay. So first, 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 an introduction. Uh, who are we, who am I, and who do I expect you to be? Who are we? We are Andor, established in 1989. It's a spinoff from the Queens University Physics Department. Uh, it's got a large headquarters, which I just came back from in Belfast, where uh, R&D and manufacturing take place. And there's also offices in Finland, Toronto, Zurich, and sales offices, local sales offices all over the world. So there's about three or 400 employees. I haven't checked today. I mean, it oscillates, people come and go, you know, join and leave, but on that order. And we're a leader in scientific imaging spectroscopy, which is hopefully why you're listening, and microscopy systems and analysis software. And I'm blocking the graphic here, but it's been part of Oxford Instruments Group since 2014. No, 2014, yes, that sounds about right. How did we get here? Uh, this is a long timeline that I don't think I necessarily want to go through here, other than the highlight of uh, when I started to use Android products, which was about 2005 or 2006, um, was fairly early on. I mean, they've been making things forever. And I became an employee about 13 years later, and I've been an employee for about four years now. So I'm an application specialist in the U.S., and I'm happy to talk to you if you're uh, looking to purchase a spectrometer or cameras or anything like that. I'm also happy to talk to you if you're not. I uh, just enjoy this, so it's a, a pleasure to be able to talk to you all about it. So what do we actually make? We make spectroscopy solutions, which means spectrometers. Let's see if you can see my, yes, the laser pointer. So spectrometers, we make uh, spectrometers here. We make cameras for spectroscopy. We make accessories for spectroscopy. And we also make low light imaging cameras. You may have seen one of our Ixons or Xylas out there. There are many, many, many of these cameras out in the wild. We also uh, sell optical cryostats and microscopy systems like the Dragonfly and BC-43. Although I am not a specialist for that, if you have questions about our confocal microscope systems, I'd be happy to route you to the right person. Who am I? I am one of the America's Field Application Specialists. There's another one, uh, Shane, who will be presenting as well. I work with scientists and engineers to identify solutions for scientific imaging and spectroscopy problems. My background is all sorts of spectroscopy, uh, optics and metrology, or optical metrology. Um, primarily uh, Raman spectroscopy, but a, a wide variety. Uh, and I got my PhD in 2012, which is uh, amazingly 10 years ago now. Ooh. Um, and, and since then, I've worked in various roles in the optics and metrology ecosystem. And I'm currently based uh, around Philadelphia in the U.S. So here's what I look like, I, which you can see from the video as well. And I had a beard at one point, which I thought was pretty funny. Might grow back for the winter. Uh, and here's me back when I had hair rolling around in Argonne. Uh, in the basement of the National Lab, or in the, in the ring around the National Lab. It's, it's not a basement, I guess it's above ground back in 2007 or so. So who are you? You might just be curious and you said, I've been assigned to do a present, to, sorry, not do a presentation, I'm doing that. I've been assigned to do a report on spectroscopy or some sort of uh, problem set and I'm just trying to figure out what, the, what on earth it is. It's possible you're getting into it. You know, you're a first year graduate student and you're starting out on some spectroscopy related problem. It's possible you're already in it and you're three years in saying, geez, what am I doing? Uh, don't be afraid that happens to a lot of people. Um, or potentially you could have been interested in mass spectroscopy or mass spectrometry or some other synonymous field 
and accidentally signed up for that, in which case I'm sorry because you're out of luck. You're not going to learn anything about that. And I'm going to talk about what I mean by spectroscopy uh, right after this slide. So this is the Andrew Learning Center. Here's the link up here. When you get, uh, we'll make these slides available as soon as possible. Uh, but you can also just search Andor Learning Center or Century, the UK spelling, Center. And you'll find this quite quickly. We have tons of articles, tons of videos, lots of really great learning content. Uh, learning content. I can't, can't encourage you enough to check it out. There's just so much good stuff on there. So what I'm actually hoping for as an outcome. So there's a fantastic spectroscopy course that's extremely extensive from Khan Academy. And I'd say, go check it out as soon as you can. It's fantastic. Um, what can I offer you in only four sessions of about 40 minutes each that, you know, is supposed to be over and above Salcon? Well, it's another perspective, some interesting, hopefully, facts about spectroscopy and the opportunity to ask questions at the end of each session. So if you have a question, uh, type it into the box or send me an email, a.wise, W-I-S-E, at andor.com. So I guess we have some interactive content that you wouldn't get otherwise. Uh, but what am I trying to offer? Well, it's another perspective. I remember trying to learn ZMAX. Uh, probably about 10 years ago, and uh, the manual was so bad, and I was just desperate for any content whatsoever. So it's like, show it to me. And meanwhile, you know, you're always trying to, you're always trying to learn something. Um, so even if I can't be objectively better than Khan Academy, uh, hopefully I can show you something different. So, all right, that's the introduction. What is spectroscopy? And, you know, everyone wants to open with like the, or, or it's cliched to open with a Webster's Dictionary definition. So, the equivalent for Webster's Dictionary for us would be the IUPAC Gold Book, perhaps, the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemists, and the definition of chemical terminology. So it's the study of physical systems, which I highlighted, by the electromagnetic radiation with which they interact or that they produce. Oh, boy. Uh, but that's a really great definition because it is very specific, uh, or at least it's very right. It's very technically correct, which is the best kind of correct. So it raises the question, what kind of physical system? Because the physical system could be anything, right? Interacting with or producing, so what kind of interaction? How do you measure that interaction and what information would you get? What value would you get from, from that interaction? And third of all, electromag electromagnetic radiation. Well, that is a lot of different things. What kind, how much, how do you make it? How do you re record it? And we will hopefully get around to at least uh, touching on all these things. But unfortunately, I found after I read that definition, it was a bit too vague. And I felt kind of like this guy from the Microsoft Outlook or Microsoft PowerPoint clip art. And um, I said, OK, well, I actually feel like I understand a little less after that definition, or I'm at least a little less confident about what, what is and what isn't spectroscopy. So is radar spectroscopy? There we have a physical system that we're learning about through its interaction with electromagnetic radiation. Is photography spectroscopy? Uh, arguable, right? These things are arguable, but this isn't what people probably think of or probably mean when they say spectroscopy. So I'm trying to give you more of a working definition here um, that isn't as um, uh, technically on point, but is a little bit more helpful. So what we normally mean, and this is very, very, very vague here, is we have a source of electromagnetic radiation. Typically, you know, say electromagnetic radiation, the cheapest and easiest and most useful is generally visible light. Could be X-rays, could be radio waves, could be terahertz waves, could be gamma rays, could be anything electromagnetic, right? But most of the time you mean visible light. Um, and I'll, I'll go into why visible light is especially important a little bit later. We shine it through or at something. Here's something. This is my physical system. It could be a solution, a gas, a mouse, like a living creature somebody's skin, the ground, the sky, whatever seems important, whatever we're trying to measure. And we see what goes through it, what's transmitted through it. And that just means the part of the radiation that gets through. Some of it is absorbed. We oftentimes can't measure that directly, but it's simply what doesn't make it through. Then there's also scattering. So scattering is one of those words that drives me crazy because it's sort of a catch-all term. And then the only really safe part of it that we can be sure is that it's the part of the radiation that didn't go where it was supposed to go or where we expected it to go. So of those types of scattering, and I'm not sure if everyone would agree with me that these are scattering, but I think some people would, are reflection. So we might look at what's reflected off at different angles. 
And we might look at fluorescence, things like fluorescence where light is or whatever is re-emitted at a lower wavelength or even sometimes a higher wavelength. Some people would say these are fluorescence, uh, sorry, some people would say these are types of scattering. But uh, that's an argument that, that you could get going is would you, you know, would you consider fluorescence a type of inelastic scattering, scattering at a different energy? Um, and again, scattering, oh, there's so many types. There's Raman scattering, um, there's Mie scattering, there's Rayleigh scattering. It's just different mechanisms that, that put light or energy or whatever that was going through somewhere else. Uh, and we're, we'll, we will go through different types of scattering later, but... This is just the general idea. So like, this is, this is I think what most people mean by spectroscopy. There's one missing ingredient that I'll go through very shortly. So, or it could be something that we put some energy into the system, be it heat, chemical, uh, or electricity or something. There, there are so many types of this and then it, and it causes the sample to emit light. So basically you, you can play Mad Libs by filling in something luminescence, you know, thermal luminescence, tribal luminescence, chemo luminescence, uh, and so on and so forth. There are just different ways of putting energy into the system. Something happens and then light comes out and we study that light. So again, some physical system here. All right, so that's just my, my uh, informal definition. But I've left off one critically important part of that definition. There isn't just one type of electromagnetic radiation. So even just in the visible spectrum, we have you know red, green, blue, all the colors of the rainbow. So spectroscopy isn't just looking at the overall interaction of material systems with electromagnetic radiation. We're really, really interested in how those interactions change as we change the wavelength, frequency, energy, color, all somewhat synonymous of that electromagnetic radiation. And we're going to go into more detail about why and how we do that uh, over the next few slides. So from real life, Here's an example that I just wanted to talk about because it was fun and interesting to me. So this is a true story. I went to my garden yesterday to pick tomatoes and I can easily tell which ones are ready to eat. And this is very trivial, but let's think about why this is, this is true by which ones are the right color and what's the right color for a tomato. Most of the time it's red. These are some, some crossbreeds that accidentally grew uh, where they're a little bit more orange here, but this one's nice and red in the background. So what's the physical system I'm studying? Uh, tomatoes. And what's the electromagnetic radiation that I'm using to study them? In this very goofy case, it's white light from the sun. So what's the interaction? Well, some colors are reflected and some are absorbed. So my goal uh, of this experiment, or this, my, my motivation here, is to enjoy some delicious tomatoes while not getting mildly poisoned with solanine, which I'm told is uh, present in green tomatoes. I've never eaten enough green tomatoes to try to get solanine poisoning. Um, and I've been told it's pretty mild. You probably get an upset stomach or something. Um, not like if you're eating wild uh, solanums, you know, in your backyard or something, and you find some little red berries, nightshades or something, you might get poisoned real, real style there. But, you know, mild, mild poisoning. Just, but they're not delicious. That's the key thing. So I think spectroscopy is happening here because what, I'm, what am I doing? And we'll, we'll go through sort of a, a closer look at a more legitimate measurement here, but uh, there's light being produced by the sun. It's bouncing. The interaction is it, it reflects off the tomato skin, gets scattered under the tomato skin, and then back out, minus some colors, right? I mean, the tomato is not fluorescing. It's just absorbing some color in the skin. It's going to my detector, which is my eye here. It's my eye. Uh, otherwise, I would have a little image credit for it. And these are my tomatoes, no image credit either. So white light from the sun travels through space hits my tomatoes and bounces off, certain colors bouncing less well. What does that mean? And a tiny amount of the light that bounces from the tomato goes into my eye, where it's sensed somehow, just not for intensity, but color. And color is the key for spectroscopy here. That's the missing ingredient. So my brain interprets this data and I choose whether to eat it or not. So is this really spectroscopy? The definitive answer is definitely maybe. Um, is this what's happening inside a spectroscopy lab? No, not really. And I apologize for putting a meme in my slide here, but I just, couldn't stop thinking about it. So what separates scientific spectroscopy from simply, you know, casual observations? It's not quantitative, no numbers. It's not that sensitive, but it's surprisingly good. The human eye and animal eyes in general are very powerful instruments. And as a result of using the human eye, it's limited to the colors slash wavelengths that we can see. And it has a very, very poor wavelength resolution. Um, I think we'll get to sort of the meaning of wavelength resolution shortly, uh, I hope, and maybe it's in a way that will make you happy, but we'll see. 
So what do I mean by that is we can't really we can't really tell colors apart that well. I mean, we can tell red from blue and many, many, many shades, but we'll see in a sec. Okay, a step back. Electromagnetic radiation, that was one of the key inputs into our spectroscopy definition. So what is electromagnetic radiation? For most of us and most of our lives and needs, that means light. So light and all forms of electromagnetic radiation, not just light, is a RA, traveling electromagnetic wave. So that's a recent realization, the full picture not really coming into view until the mid 19th century. And I find it really counterintuitive. I would not have expected that of all the, the possible different theories about what uh, light and vision were. I mean, people have been speculating about it since the beginning of, of time, I suppose, as soon as people could talk and have ideas like that. Um, at least it's recorded as soon as people could record things. Um, the wave nature was realized earlier in the 17th century, but no one, of course, knew what the waves were happening in, and I'm still not comfortable with it. Uh, the most surprising part to me, and the part that I find is relevant here, is that the color, so color seems like such an important part, an important qualitative part, red and green and blue, uh, these things that we have very discrete names for, discrete phenomenon for, and, and what we associate kind of emotionally with them, that all these different colors were the same wave with different spatial distances between the crests of the, the wave. Uh, so different wavelengths, so literally a different spatial separation between uh, those, or if you think about it in terms of frequency, and we'll talk about that in a sec, just a, a different time before you get hit with the next peak of that, of that electric field. And so this is one of the interesting parts here is that color exists in our perception. So I can tell you that this light here is about 650 nanometers in wavelength. And I can tell you here that this wave, uh, this, this light source is emitting waves that are about 530 nanometers in wavelength. But our eyes and our brain don't perceive, you know, this is a numerical continuous value. We see two discrete colors, green and red, and they look quite different to us. So again, color is a perception. Uh, and these waves that we, that we experience or that we see they have an intensity and a wavelength. Those are both kind of numerical values, or at least we can uh, uh, reduce them to numerical values in, in a model. Uh, these waves also have polarization, and we'll talk about that later probably, but we don't care about that quite yet. So just a reminder, I've been kind of flippantly using light or visible light as a synecdoche, is that the right word? For electromagnetic radiation, um, the whole, or sorry, a part standing for the whole, um, but electromagnetic radiation, electromagnetic radiation is a very, very broad range of phenomenon that you wouldn't necessarily think are, are subspecies of the same thing, but they're all unified by being the same phenomenon happening in different wavelengths. Again, that wavelength top, uh, concept. Uh, and wavelength and energy are intrinsically bound, and I'll show you that on the next slide. Um, I'm hoping you're not using this presentation to learn about, uh, you know, you're just finding out that, that uh, about the wave nature of light. If you are, you know, I'm glad that you heard it from you heard it from me. Um, but just a just a reminder again, we're particularly interested in this zone here around the visible. You know, going from infrared to ultraviolet. Uh, there's interesting phenomenon happening up and down the entire wavelength range from radio to gamma ray, with lower energy stuff down here, higher energy stuff down here. But we're this this stuff has a special plate. Uh, this stuff being visible and uh, it's visible IR to, to UV. Beyond just being special to us because we can see most of it or some of it, probably not most, um, this is the, the characteristic energy of a lot of important stuff. So molecular vibrations, uh, electronic transitions in atoms and molecules. This just happens to be the range where it lives. Um, and you might say, well, couldn't there be um, a molecular vibration, you know, an IR, well, an IR band somewhere out, out here in the gamma rays. And it's like, oh, no, not really. Physics just doesn't allow it. Um, and I don't know if we're going to have time to talk about why that might be the case, but just accept it for a fact of nature, I guess, for the moment. So I'd mentioned that wavelength and frequency were inseparable, or at least bound in some way. And it's just through this relationship here. So the speed of light is fixed, at least in a particular medium. And the wavelength and the frequency multiply to give you the speed of light. So if this goes up, if the wavelength goes up, 
the frequency has to go down. And you can kind of keep track of the units here. So this is meters, and I'm putting in meters per cycle. I think cycle's technically not real, but just for bookkeeping. So meters per cycle is the wavelength. So how many meters through space does it take to make one cycle of the wave? And then frequency, how many cycles of those are happening per second? If you were standing still at a particular spot and you were you had your, your finger up in the air as you were measuring the electric field, you know, how many, how many times per second would that cycle? So the product of that is fixed. So again, if uh, wavelength goes up, frequency goes down and vice versa. So just wanted to set that as a reminder. So I mentioned before that there were some severe limitations to using your eye as a detector. And somebody who's sitting in the audience might say, why is this guy talking about the eye as a detector? Nobody's using their eyes as a detector. Uh, not anymore, because we have such severe limitations. But of course, that's how it all began. And I'll talk about a little bit of the history real quick. But one of the limitations, one of the major limitations of our eyes for color sensing is that we can't easily tell yellow-orange light from mixed red and green light. So here's your, your green light. And I mentioned it's peaked around 530, and it's my, my opinion here, 530 to 550. And here's some red light, say around 650. Shine them at a piece of paper overlapping, and because of additive color, you get something that looks like it's about 560 nanometers, sort of in between. Uh, we're around there, but it's clearly yellow. Uh, is the, question, or the question is, are those waves mixing somehow? And there are strange nonlinear spectroscopies that do create you know, mixed, mixtures of waves and, and do funny things there. But no, this is just our, the limitation of our eye. Uh, what drives that limitation? Why can't we really perceive color uh, very carefully or very, very, very accurately? Don't get me wrong, we have fantastic color vision. But because our eyes mostly rely on three photoreceptors for color detection, and I always throw in mostly because some people may only have two. Some people seem to have four, I've read, but it doesn't actually help them. But there are three dyes, basically, or three pigments in, in the average human eye. There's one that, that responds well to blue, and this is sensitivity here, although I'm blocking the axis label. Sensitivity, so high sensitivity up here, low sensitivity up here. Uh, there's a blue pigment, uh, a greenish pigment, and then a red pigment. And this, this looks to me ignorantly as I'm not, I'm not an evolutionary biologist, but this looks like when nature creates a new thing by duplicating and tweaking an old one. Uh, so this is, this is our red and green separation. Not very much separation there. But any color, say we have some super, super narrow band color here or here or here, it'll excite in different proportions these three pigments. And then our brains will process that and create an experience based on those signals coming from there. So we're decomposing any color signal that we get onto uh, three basis vectors, two of which are not very separate or not very well separated, not very orthogonal. Um, and our color space perception is a bit limited on that. We can't, we can't do sensitive, sensitive color measurements. And I'll talk about not just, not just discriminating two colors, but sort of telling about a particular color, how saturated or how deep it is. Um, on the other hand, there's this amazing creature called the mantis shrimp. And I remember this, uh, I mean, obviously the creature has been around for millions of years, but I remember all of a sudden the mantis shrimp was in the news like crazy, you know, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, I, I can't remember, about all the amazing things it can do. It can snap its claws faster than the speed of sound. Um, it creates sonic booms. It can see in, you know, a million wavelengths and whatever. Uh, so people have figured out, and I'm, through the reference there that mantis shrimps might have, some mantis shrimps might have up to 12 photoreceptors, types of, types of dye in their eyes or pigments in their eyes absorbing light, um, which sounds incredible. That means that you can, you'd be able to, in theory, separate, you know, light that's coming in here or here or here and very, very, very carefully sort of build up a, uh, a sensitive narrow band, you know, seeing, telling a couple of nanometers difference in wavelength from, from color to color. Um, they potentially have much, much better color vision than humans. Uh, seems like actually not. Um, maybe this is a, I'm not, I'm not a, an expert again in mantis shrimp biology. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe in another life. But I guess there's a, there's some contention about whether they actually have better color vision or whether it's a, um, an information processing trick that they're using. But there are other, I guess I just mean to raise that there's other, there's other um, approaches to color vision out there in the animal kingdom. So the point I'm trying to make is that our eyes and animal eyes in general are not that great of a tool for separating by color. Wouldn't it be helpful, thought some people, you know, hundreds of years ago, if we could physically sell, separate colors for easier measurement? So mid 17th century, Isaac Newton and surely others, I mean, I think it was just a particular moment in time, start experimenting with prisms. So 
uh, I think everyone's familiar, I'm possibly making an assumption there, this is a woodcut or something, an engraving, and it's showing um, light coming in through a, a little slit in the window. And this, you know, it's daytime outside. He's got the shutters of his room closed. I think he was doing this in his dorm room, Isaac Newton, uh, going in a little beam, little beam path here, narrow, narrow beam of light into a prism, getting separated into colors, and the colors separating physically on a wall. So our eyes are still the detector, but we're not as worried about using our color vision anymore. We're looking at the intensity of a spot on the wall. All of a sudden, we can create some relationship between position and wavelength. Uh, he certainly was aware of what he was doing. My question after thinking about it a little bit more was, where did he get a glass prism if no one was using them to separate colors? Um, kind of how I had been thinking about it a little bit ignorantly was, you know, he's he's sitting in his room and of course we, we like, we think about Isaac Newton as getting hit with an apple or something. These ideas just come to him, you know, out of, out of the void and he just gets these great ideas. So I'm imagining him just sitting in his dorm room and he says, I should create a, I should create a prism. Um, I'll maybe I'll, you know, I draw, you know, I, I go to the to the, the glass cutter or whatever the, the glass merchant and say, bring me here's a here's a picture of a of a triangle longer. Now make me one of these and I'm going to use it to discover the rainbow. So of course that wasn't actually the case. So he he bought the glass prism apparently at a, a country fair, uh, and it's like, well, what were they doing selling prisms there? Um, I guess country fairs were, were bigger deals a few hundred years ago, but prisms have been popular since antiquity because people liked the cool colors they made. Uh, people knew that they made rainbows. So the discovery here, uh, and I was amazed, I'm sorry if it's, if it's not as impressive to you, it wasn't that he discovered that prisms make rainbows. It was he, he fit that fact that people had known about since the time of Seneca, thousands of years ago, 2000 years ago, um, into this mathematical model of what light was. And here's a drawing from his journal, I guess you could say, his, uh, his proto lab notebook about how he's setting this up. Um, again, all, all the pieces are here for, for building a spectrometer. And uh, we're going to talk about that quickly here. So enter the spectroscope or a spectrometer, depending on whether you're looking into it or whether it's going on to some other detector. So even this first shaky prototype has all the parts in place. So there's an entrance slit here that limits the amount of light coming in and shapes it in a particular shape and size. Then there's a dispersive element that separates things by color that changes the angle something goes through by color. And it is a, uh, in this case, a prism on a, what appears to be a candlestick. And our detector is a white screen. Uh, looks like a board on the wall. I assume you couldn't just go to Home Depot in those days and buy a piece of plywood. Uh, you know, however they made, I'm, I'm not sure what kind of screen this is. It could be uh, fabric or something. Um, maybe it's in his original notes. But although it seems silly, all these, all this, this is sort of the prototype of the spectrometer, which is to say uh, a machine that separates color by some process and makes it easier to record and measure. But this begs the question, why do prisms actually separate color? And I really encourage you to go play around with Falstad's ripple tank applets as well as all of his other science applets because they're just so amazing. But if you have simply a wave, here's the wave, you can see that this is, this is sort of a cross-sectional view. If we were looking down into this famous uh, uh, album cover here, this is the side of the prism. If we have a wave, and although these wavelengths, sorry, these, the, the length of these waves are, are microscopic, sub-sub-microscopic for visible light. If we have a wave incident at an angle on something that has a different refractive index, well, what's a different refractive index? It's a different speed of transmission for light, if light has a different speed inside that material. Uh, what happens? Well, the wave fronts get bunched up and basically bent into the material. So waves incident on a slower medium bunch up and pivot into the material. So why does it separate colors? Well, uh, different wavelengths, different frequencies, have a different index of refraction in different in, in materials. So there's a, here's a crown glass. So maybe you've heard of uh, crown and flint glasses in the, in the um, context of making lenses and stuff. So here's BK7, a very common glass, and here's the refractive index going from blue to near infrared. Changes quite a bit. So refractive index changes with wavelength, different colors bent into different directions. And you can see, again, my uh, Pink Floyd cover here. Of course, if you go into a spectroscopy lab nowadays, you wouldn't see uh, a bunch of guys in wigs or women in wigs as well, um, standing around in front of a prism inverted on a candlestick, although that would be really cool. This is actually getting closer. This is an early 19th century design. I believe this is Kirchhoff's, uh, a, a visualization of Kirchhoff's spectrometer. 
a beautiful visualization um, from beautifulchemistry.net that uh, you can link to here. And it's, it's capturing more and more of what we, what we see in spectrometers currently. And again, spectrometer being a sensitive device for, for separating colors by spatially, in that we have an entry, we have a source here, a light source of our source of electromagnetic radiation, which is a hot flame, an entrance slit made out of a precision brass machined aperture as, as uh, at this point in history, manufacturing of metals or, or shaping of metals, metalwork is getting very refined um, and very precise. And uh, that entrance slip, slit leads to a dispersive element here, a prism mounted on some kind of simple but effective rotation stage. And then that gets sent whatever, by rotating this, it sends a particular wavelength, a range of wavelengths to the detector, which is still your eye. Uh, why would it be your eye? Well, there's not a lot of alternatives in the early 19th century. Um, keep in mind, photography had more or less just been invented. So photos look like this. Uh, I think that's a roof maybe no people on it. I, again, not, not, the, not the most sensitive detector at this point if you're gonna use photography. So not much chance of replacing the human eye yet. Uh, although you can imagine if you were to point this at the sun, maybe you could with uh, you know, long enough exposure burn it into a piece of wood or something, but I don't recall that happening yet. But speaking of the sun, uh, enter the spectrum. So the spectrum, and I'm pointing to spectra. I think I showed you a spectrum of a uh, the human eye pigments a few slides ago, but at this point we're replacing subjective the subjective color experience with something numerical. So a table of or a visualization of uh, numerical wavelengths and intensities. So before we may have looked at the sun and say it looks yellow white or maybe when it sets it looks red and it has such and such you know of a visual appearance or I could say it got brighter or I could even you know look at it with some sort of telescope. Uh, hopefully with you know a blocking filter in there and draw pictures of um, sunspots and stuff. I can do I can do uh, quantitative, really basic stuff. But now we send this spectrom sorry we send this uh, picture of the sun or this the view of the sun through a, through a spectrometer and all of a sudden we don't just see colors anymore. We can see these well we if you're uh, Joseph von Fraunhofer, we can see absorption lines in this in what seemed like a continuous spectrum. So if you if you're able to look with fine enough spectral resolution and I should probably talk about spectral resolution more, you'll start to see interesting phenomena that you never would have seen before. So this is 1815, uh, Fraunhofer is recording these high resolution spectra of the sun. And the way he's doing that, I believe, is he's projecting the spectra of the sun through a simple spectrometer. Well, simple to us, maybe, but at the time it was incredibly cutting edge and objectively very precisely made, but he's projecting these onto, I think, I believe, I believe a big wall and tracing them uh, to get spectra of the sun. Why would he do that? Um, they were very curious about what was happening um, and they were discovering uh, new elements. They were trying to figure out, you know, what was, what was going on with, uh, with that big thing up in the sky. Um, fundamental human curiosity. Back to those tomatoes, which obviously very important there. And I'm making a subjective personal experience or personal decision when I say, uh, this is good to eat, don't eat this one. Um, I could probably teach someone or I could teach even an, an animal to, to make that decision. But um, if I wanted to make sure it was actually being done to my, my exacting standards, uh, if I want to study these tomatoes and figure out if I'm breeding them to mature better or to have more, you know, whatever that great red stuff in it is, we'll go to that in a sec. But if I want to actually do standardization or if I want to quantify any of these things, then I need to actually switch from uh, my subjective human measurements to some sort of scientific, you know, spectroscopic measurement. So in that case, I'd be switching to a stable light source rather than the sun. Well, maybe I could use the sun in some, some cases. And then uh, replacing my eye with a spectrometer and a detector. And we'll go into the design for these in, I believe, number three, uh, the third lecture. So the overall components that go into those. So what spectroscopy lets us do is go from a subjective experience of color or a rough experience of color to an objective quantitative experience of the interaction of different wavelengths, different colors with, with material systems. So here is some very important stuff, tomato reflectance spectroscopy. So unsurprisingly, and this is looking at the light that bounces off a tomato. So if we shine white light at a tomato, what comes back to us? Unsurprisingly, uh, unripe tomatoes reflect green light while ripe tomatoes mostly reflect red light. So we haven't really learned about what that happens, uh, why that happens, but for a second, let's just talk about this. So down on the bottom here, we have numbers, and that's the wavelength in nanometers. Up here, we have 
uh, a super, I've superimposed a little color rainbow here as a reminder, as an aid to the aid to memory. So from working with filters and working with lasers for so long at this point in my life, I have a pretty visceral, re visceral reaction if someone says, you know, 480 nanometers, I can picture right off what that looks like, a nice brilliant blue. So over here, 480, super, super blue, really nice blue. Uh, and then you might, you might not have that dialed in yet, and it might come with time if you care enough to, and if you don't, don't worry about it, it you know, you always look it up. Uh, but 550-ish, 540, 550 is, you know, green, uh, shading to yellow green. And then out here we have nice deep red and, you know, 640 to 660. Uh, although I colored this red, I think that's going to the point where you can no longer see it very well. Um, at least it's been my experience. And again, your, your mileage may vary with your eyes. I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if there was pretty decent human variation in how well people see near infrared light. I'd love to see, I'm sure someone studied that. Someone studied everything. But I know that I couldn't see um, um, a 680 laser very well. Uh, at least I, I wouldn't want to have to get too close to it to look at it. I don't think I was picking it up that well. And this is where it really tails off into the near infrared. So tomato reflecting spectroscopy, not telling us necessarily anything we didn't know quite yet. Uh, but now we can quantify it and we can say, you know, set a limit for beyond this, don't sell it. Um, you know, here is where we pick it. Uh, are we going to make everybody measure the spectra before we um, have them pick it, pick the tomato? Probably not, but we can do some standards and it helps us study and talk about it. Now here to me is where it gets very interesting when we're going beyond what humans can do. And this is sort of one of the advantages of, of uh, being able to do spectroscopy at different wavelength ranges. So more surprisingly, more surprisingly than noting that unripe tomatoes reflect more green light, is that beyond the visible spectrum, there's even more going on. So I've superimposed the visible spectrum here. I just went, I just told you that it goes roughly from 400 to 700, plus or minus, but that's, I think, close enough for, for my opinion, is that you can see, and this is a, a tomato, the reflectance spectra of a tomato, and I've inset some tomatoes in case you don't remember what they look like. Uh, we're seeing more or less the same features here, but beyond the visible, there's far, far more going on. So actually, you can measure... Uh, the sugar content, or actually technically sol soluble solids content, uh, and they show up with near infrared absorption and short. So both in the near infrared, near infrared, you know, this region, short of infrared, around this region. I th I'm sure there's a definition for where they split, but near infrared means you know just the red side of visible, and then short of infrared is out you know from one micron, a thousand wave, a thousand wave numbers out to a couple of microns. Should look that up. Uh, but we can actually see a lot more information there. So potentially we're not just looking at whether it's ripe, but how much sugar they have. And we have some more info in the learning center about that. So here's where it might start to get a little bit hand wavy, but I wanted to point out tomato pigments. So there are two main pigments, two main molecules, or at least types of molecules, responsible for the color of tomatoes. The, at the top, at the top, there's lycopene. And I'm sure you may have heard of lycopene before as a desirable thing to put in your diet. Um, I haven't really looked too closely into how uh, much proof there is for lycopene in your diet um, helping with your health overall, but you know, eating vegetables is not going to hurt you and it's probably quite good for you. Um, and then chlorophyll, I hope everyone's heard of chlorophyll before. I threw the structures in there. Um, and here's a type of, a, a type of chlorophyll uh, to my left that I'm slightly superimposed over here. Um, but arguably one of the most, uh, no, the, the most important uh, molecule in the world, you know, in terms of that's what uh, turns light into food uh, that we need to eat. So chlorophyll is what makes our green tomatoes green and uh, all other plants, well, all, all the other common plants green as well, leaves and so on. Uh, if you look here, it's an absorption spectra of chlorophyll A and B, which I believe are the most common chlorophylls out there. And here's the absorption spectrum here. And again, uh, to refer back to my previous, my early slide, we take a, crush up some leaves, extract the chlorophylls, maybe some carotenoids too. It's another plant dye involved in photosynthesis. Shine a white light through there and measure what wavelengths get through and which ones don't. So chlorophylls uh, absorb in the blue and a little, a little bit in the red, less so. Uh, interestingly enough, they don't absorb in the green. And the green is the stuff that makes it out. That's the light that, that can, when it bounces around in the skin of the tomato, that's the stuff that doesn't get absorbed and makes it to your eye. I find that very surprising, and a lot of people find that very surprising, because if you look at this NREL spectrum, the solar spectrum at ground level, 
So here's our visible right here. The peak of that solar spectrum is more or less in the green. Uh, now, why wouldn't you want to use a large uh, part of the solar spectrum to, if you're a plant, your goal is to make as much energy as possible out of the light? Uh, that's an interesting question, and I'm not um, well-versed enough to give a definitive answer, nor do I believe there necessarily is one. Um, I've seen some really interesting answers, but I think it's a, just a great question because it seems like it's the most fundamental thing in the world, plants turning light into food. Uh, why wouldn't they try to maximize that? Meanwhile, another molecule, another carotenoid, uh, is lycopene, and lycopene is what makes the tomatoes red. So lycopene, on the other hand, absorbs uh, in the slightly different, slightly different wavelength axis here, but another absorption spectrum, um, and it absorbs in the blue and most of the green as well. So it starts to tail off towards the yellow. So it, pass, it will pass uh, or allow to move through it um, yellow and red light. So uh, lycopene is a conjugated organic molecule, and it's found in many, many photosynthetic organisms. Um, tomatoes and other red things just happen to have a lot of it you know, on display. Uh, and you can see it's conjugated, and we don't have the time or the scope probably to talk too much about conjugation, but whenever you see uh, these alternating single and double bonds, uh, and you can see double, single, double, single, double, single, double, single, then you can probably bet there's going to be some color at play here. Um, we'll see whether we have time to talk about conjugation, but you end up with big molecular orbitals that span big chunks of the molecule and have low energy, usually in the visible transitions or absorption. So in its UV spectrum, like I mentioned, it absorbs blue and green light, and it doesn't absorb yellow and red light. Uh, why, though, is a question that I'm going to hand wave through a little bit and talk about quickly. So let's revisit electromagnetic radiation at a closer, in a closer look, so or at, at a closer scale. So if we were to zoom in on one of these, and this isn't really what it looks like, right? This is just a representation of the electric field and the magnetic field being at a right angle to each other, orthogonal, and having a particular wavelength and uh, direction of propagation, a direction that they're, they're going that way. So um, the thing that I want to stress, though, is that these wavelengths, in the case of green or visible green light, 550 nanometers from peak to peak here. So if you're, that that's, sounds like not very much space, but if you're a lycopene molecule and you're a couple of nanometers long, so here's, here's lycopene, uh, a lycopene molecule here, just doodle more or less to scale. Uh, the point is that it's really small. So you don't see this whole picture here. You don't see like, you know, waves coming and going. What you experience is a huge electric field going through you one direction, then it calms down and it goes the other direction. So, so I ask you to exercise your imagination. If you were an atom or a molecule, a very, very small body uh, being hit with an electromagnetic wave that had to you a very, very long wavelength, how would you experience that? Well, you're a lot smaller. So you see basically a homogeneous electric field. You're sitting there and the electric field is going up and you get, you get shaken up. Your, your, your positives go in one direction, your negatives go in the other direction. So you're getting squeezed, you're getting polarized. Then half a femtosecond later or whatever, whatever the frequency is, then that, that uh, electric field is at a minimum. Then another femtosecond later, another half a femtosecond later, the electric field is going the opposite way. And all of a sudden your positives get pushed the other way, your negatives get pushed you know, the, the, the opposite way and again. So this happens over and over and over again. So you feel a homogeneous, more or less homogeneous, you know, to your scale, time varying electric field pulling one way and then the other way over and over and over again rhythmically. So I'm going to hand wave through a lot of this, but that's the key is that you're getting shaken rhythmically. You're getting polarized rhythmically by an electric field. So what happens if you rhythmically push some system that has little bits that can react to it? So what could happen is that we could resonate with part of the molecule or something in the molecule. And we'll talk about what those mechanisms are either today or on the next one. But we can push a system at any frequency. So we have a guy on a swing being pushed by a child. Maybe it's his son or a friend. Uh, and say his resonant frequency is one swing per half second. So if we want that guy to gain energy from our pushing, from our rhythmic pushing, if we want energy from us to go into him efficiently, we have to push at the resonant frequency. So if our frequency is too high or too low, the push E doesn't absorb any energy from us. So we're the electric field. He's part of the molecule or the whole molecule or some, some, uh, something that responds to the, to the electric field 
of light, of electromagnetic radiation. That's, that's cyclically switching directions. So for example, if we were to push a, push a guy in a swing or a child on a swing at 200 times per second and go brrr, like a hummingbird, uh, they're going to vibrate. They won't swing. They won't pick up, energy, pick up any more energy over time. They'll also probably be very annoyed. On the other hand, if we were to push them uh, once, come back 30 seconds later, push them again, um, and it didn't line up perfectly, then we're not going to trans transmit any energy into those into them either. So what I mean to say is that the reason that these different uh, molecules are picking up waves of different energy or absorbing waves of different energy is because they have parts of them that will resonate. They have uh, electrons in particular orbitals that will resonate um, and go up to a higher energy state, or they have um, two oppositely charged uh, or slightly oppositely charged uh, parts of the molecule that can vibrate. And, and that'll pick up energy. And likewise, then they can then re-radiate energy back into the field from those, from those vibrations. So electrons and atoms and molecules can resonate at different frequencies, and we can learn about what's going on in the molecule based on that. We're running out of time for today. I'm already, I might already be over time, but uh, as an example of um, dubious value, although it's amazing and thought-provoking, is that uh, you can see an uh, S to P transition um, animated. Is it real? No. Is it totally fake? No. Um, it's a great model and an interesting and thought-provoking exercise about how um, atomic orbitals uh, transition from one to the other. I introduced this really out of nowhere, but uh, just in terms of uh, food for thought about how changing electric fields can do things at the, at the atomic level or at the molecular level. I'd love you to check out this uh, Again, another advertisement for a Falstad app if you're not tired of those already. One can charitably imagine uh, pushing an S into a P orbital with a time varying electric field. So we're gonna go through more about the actual mechanisms of, of uh, light absorption and emission in our next lecture or next talk uh, next week with Shane. Um, Shane and I's presentation, Shane's gonna be giving it. So that's a great uh, time to talk about our conclusions for today. So spectroscopy, as you might imagine from that very loose definition, sorry, very broad definition, is a very broad field. So it's the study of physical systems by how they interact with electromagnetic radiation, technically, but it's more. In practice, much of the spectrum is difficult to produce or measure. I mean the overall electronic, sorry, the overall electromagnetic spectrum. So uh, if you wanted to have a variable gamma ray source, uh, that might be expensive and possibly dangerous or illegal. If you want to have a variable terahertz source, that could be quite difficult to set up. Uh, so in practice, a lot of it's visible or near visible, but infrared and uh, other stuff as well. So instrumentation, spe uh, spectrometers and detectors, let us separate and detect colors sensitively. And it sounds so trivial, detecting colors sensitively, but that is what uh, spectroscopy is. It is for a very charitable definition of color, meaning something, a, a wavelength that goes all the way from, all the way to the lowest, the lowest, lowest high energy X-rays you can imagine, or gamma rays. Uh, and then you dial it all the way through visible, which is in there, and you dial all the way uh, to low energy radio waves like cosmic background radiation. Those are all colors in any sense of the word, right? We might not have names for them distinctly as red, green, blue, cyan, magenta, and so on, but um, sensitive color measurement. So next week and beyond, like I mentioned, uh, Shane, my associate, who we'll, we'll, introduce, uh, we'll, we'll get introduced to next week, is going to present spectroscopy technique, techniques in practice. So he's going to discuss and break down, meaning kind of talk about the details and the practicalities of common measurement types like UV vis absorption, uh, photoluminescence, infrared absorption, and whatever else we have time for. Uh, thanks again for listening uh, for about 48 minutes and counting now. Um, and hopefully I've gotten some questions. I'm going to take a look at that real quick. I'm, I've been watching the screen as we go here, but I'll have time to answer some questions now. Uh, thanks again. Sorry about my voice. I'm just coming back from a cold. Um, but uh, thanks again for your patience and for sticking it out. And if you're uh, watching from the Learning Center, I hope the future is going well for you and that everything is, uh, has, has come uh, as it's worked out well from the interesting couple of months we're having here. All right. Thanks again. Uh, and I'll
Uh, hang on, I'm about to share my screen again here. Uh, where did it go? Uh, there we go. I just want to show a schedule slide. Hopefully you can see this. Oop, let's go view as a slideshow here. Uh, actually, I'm just gonna leave that up. So I uh, just wanted to put this, I, I don't think I discreetly said this, we're gonna redo, or we're gonna, we're gonna do these sessions every week at, uh, on Thursday at 4 p.m. BST, uh, which if you live in Europe will mean a lot to you. For me, that time works out to be 11 a.m. in the Eastern US, uh, and these will be live. Um, we got a ton of questions about whether we, will, whether we have the slides available and whether we'll have the recordings available. Um, we will definitely have the recordings available, which you'll be able to see in the Andor Learning Center as soon as we post them. Uh, I will check with uh, the person who is in charge of that and see when they're gonna be available, but I think quite soon. Um, and we'll definitely make the slides available as well. Uh, maybe we can send out a um, download link to the list. I will check again with the person who's, who's in, in charge of that. So I'm just gonna run through these uh, questions real quick and skipping any of the questions that are about whether we get a recording or not. So uh, let's see, can we get a recording? Yes, for sure. Is the meeting recorded? Yes, let's see. I'm sorry about the, the volume. I'll, I'll, I realized listening to it now, my voice is already pretty indistinct and I should have used a slightly better microphone. I'm just, uh, I'm getting lazy and I'll definitely do a better job with the AV on the next one. So, uh, Thank you so much. That's thank you, uh, Super Deep, for listening. Um, let's see. So I got a question from uh, uh, Saham here, and he's asking if you could use a spectroscopy for phase characterization. Absolutely. So he's asking whether, and I apologize for my presentation being all over the place in terms of content going from Isaac Newton to tomatoes and whatever, without perhaps covering what you were looking to learn. And uh, if that's the case, and it almost certainly is, um, please just send me a note, email or whatever, and, and ask uh, um, the more votes that we get or the more, the more uh, uh, notes and complaints and stuff that I get, the more likely that we are to cover something in, in a subsequent um, either a presentation or we'll invite someone who's, do, who's practicing in research in the field to talk about it. But the question was, could you explain if uh, spectroscopy is used for phase characterization? It absolutely is. Uh, the problem or the complexity is that the phase, phase uh, um, determination or phase discrimination. Uh, there are so many different types of, of material phases. So we could be talking about phases in, in steel um, or phases in, uh, uh, you know, like for example, you could easily spectroscopically tell diamond from carbon, right? Just, or, or diamond from, from uh, graphite, just from, from how it transmits light. So absolutely, the question would be, what material system are you looking to tell the phases uh, in between? Um, or, or discriminating one phase from another. It could be uh, done through Raman, looking at vibrational changes or changes in symmetry, uh, potentially through, um, I'm probably less likely to do it via IR, but uh, even something as simple as absorption. Uh, I know that like phases of phosphorus have completely different colors, but again, you need to know, or you need to specify kind of what material we're talking about here to talk more about the phases. Let's see. Um, Evangelist, thanks again, man, for listening. I appreciate your appreciation. Um, we'll put them up and you can for sure use them if you can find some value in any of this. Uh, let just, just send me an email privately if you don't mind, a.wise at andor.com. I'd be happy to uh, um, hand them over. Uh, question again about heavy metals. So heavy in the sense of density, like high, high atomic number. Um, so uh, I didn't, I didn't go, I, I covered a ton of stuff very uh, superficially. Uh, for working with metals, uh, it's less likely you'd be able to do a lot of, you know, UV vis type measurements on, say, you know, telling steel from nickel from, uh, or, you know, um, different compositions of steel. Uh, typically for, for metals, you might look at something like, uh, you could look at something like uh, optical emission spectroscopy, where you uh, put some energy into the surface of the metal uh, either electrically or with a laser, and you look at the the uh, emission lines, the atomic emission lines from from the the, uh, the atoms that are present in there. So that might be something like atomic emission spectroscopy, where you're you know if you're trying to determine whether lead is present, or if you're trying to determine how much 
uh, additives are in a particular stainless steel uh, uh, formula or something like that. So for sure, we can do spectroscopy on heavy metals, um, and the exact type uh, would would be uh, would, would kind of be up to what you're trying to do. Um, of course, a lot of metal ions absorb in the visible or or around. So you might do something as simple as if you're looking at you know heavy metal ions. That could be a pretty simple optical absorption measurement that, that would be that would lend itself to UV, to a UV vis style measurement, uh, measuring a simple absorption spectra. Um, let's see, uh, light source nature of spectroscopy. I'm um, sorry, this, this is a long question. I just want to make sure I read this here. Uh, so uh, yeah, they're, they're at, so so this is a, um, a question from the web saying, uh, you showed the sun as an example. Well, the sun is a very obviously a very bright light source and it's very broadband. So historically it's been very useful. Um, also the, the light coming from it is pretty collimated, which makes it easy to focus if you wanna burn something or you know, focus into a fiber or something. Uh, so the, this person's asking me, um, what if you had a tunable narrowband laser and you only use certain wavelengths? Well, that would be much better uh, because you'd have a lot more control about what wavelengths are going on going in. We're going to talk about this heavily in uh, lecture three about spectrometer um, that we're, we're going to talk very, very closely about equipment. So yeah, if you, if you had, if you had something that was very, very, if you had a laser that was very, very bright and very, very tunable through all of the visible wavelengths and maybe beyond, yeah, sure. I'd prefer that to the sun. That's cer still certainly spectroscopy. Um, the thing is the sun is free. I mean, well, it's not free in terms of, you know, having no value or something. You can't get a free sun uh but it's you know it's it's publicly available overhead all the time uh whereas a tunable light source that's very narrow band and very bright uh could cost you quite a bit of money um and uh there are there are different um approaches to generating monochromatic or single color bright light and um the fanciest type if you have like a tunable laser it could cost you you know uh, as much as a very as, as much as a sports car right so yeah, it's certainly still spectroscopy and, it, and it's probably preferable, but you know, it makes it more difficult to have the equipment. Um, difference between spectrometer and detector. I'm very, I'm just playing it so fast and loose with my terminology here. So a spectrometer is that which separates and measures the light. The detector is the part that's actually doing the measurement. So I didn't really draw a distinction. And also the distinction itself is a bit fuzzy. But generally, when someone says spectroscope, it means that you're looking through it. A spectrograph means that it's being recorded somehow. And a spectrometer means that it's being measured. The light, that is, is being measured as it's being separated. So the detector itself, a detector is just something that detects light. And again, we'll go through this uh, in the third um, meeting in two weeks on Thursday, October 6th. But you could have a detector that doesn't necessarily uh, um, separate light. But you could you could also mount a detector on a uh, uh, on a spectrometer. So I apologize. I should I should draw a distinction. I will make a note to like talk about terminology more. Um, let's see. But but a, spe a a detector a spectrometer has some sort of detector, but it, but a spectrometer and detector aren't necessarily the same thing, or they're not they're not always overlapping. Um, I uh, Manav Sharma. Uh, you're asking about iStar cameras. We have we have some cool content about that that we did. We just did a short course. Uh, feel free to send me an email and we can we can chat about that if you're still listening. Uh, polarization of molecules while while interacting with um, electromagnetic radiation. Um, if the median may polarize, or only if the molecules of interest polarizes. Uh, we're, I think we're talking about silatochromism a little bit later in the next in the next talk next week. Uh, I have to think about that one because I'm not quite sure how to parse your question. Um, polarization of molecules while interacting. So uh, they're they're both going to polarize, both the medium and the molecule, right? They're gonna, they're they're experiencing the electric field in the same direction. Um, it depends on uh, it depends on so much. I'm sorry, I'm I'm not smart enough to to give you a, a good concise answer that uh, um, that would be generally interesting. But feel free to send me an email, and I'm happy to to, to talk to bring it up offline. Uh, spectroscopy is used for subcellular, mem subcellular, subcellular membranes all the time. So for so confocal scanning uh, or, or hyperspectral imaging of some sort can give you a lot of insight into those things. Um, femtosecond and uh, 
so question about, um, could you say a little bit more about FEMP, but FS, which I, I'm choosing to, to interpret as femtosecond. Oh, and attosecond, AT spectroscopy. Ah, oh, man, I wish it, I, 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 I created myself, I created for myself a ridiculous challenge of, I put so much into the syllabus on this and then I had like a 40 minute time limit. So I'm putting things about Isaac Newton in here and I did not do a good job of time management. Um, I would love to set up uh, something about um, ultra fast spectroscopy, but that is, that is a, a its own broad thing um, that is that reveals a tremendous amount of information far beyond my my kind of goofy tomato example. Although maybe there's some um, there's a ton of actual uh, ultra fast uh, experiments that bear on how photosynthesis plays out. So uh, that would be a fantastic thing that I'd love to set up. Although I'm not qualified to talk on it, uh, I can think of some people off uh, some of our our users who who might be be able to tell a good story about that. Um, very different perspective. Yeah, that's what I'm going for. Thank you, uh, Masood. Um, eye perception. Uh, let's see. I'm just reading. I'm just reading this question real quick. Uh, I don't know how to answer that. Sorry, Roger. I'm, I'll have to take a look at this. Um, yeah. So, uh, Jim, you're you're saying uh, um, images from NASA that they post are not actually what they see, they're interpreting the EM into pretty pictures. Uh, absolutely, I also think that's unfair, but um, the pictures are sweet. Uh, they're, they're what's called false color, so they'll map, say, infra, some certain parts of the infrared or ultraviolet spectra to different colors. So it's not, space isn't quite as psychedelic as it seems, unfortunately, uh, but if you search sort of like astro astronomy false color, you'll you'll see um, sort of how that how that's laid out. I'm probably way over time, um, and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna save this list of questions. And uh, there's um, a bunch of great stuff in here. Uh, I'm almost at the end, but I'm gonna get less and less coherent as we go on here, and I think I've already used up. So uh, I'm I'm being told by the moderator that I I'm out of time and that I can answer these questions offline. If you don't hear from me, it's just because I got I got distracted. Uh, and please do send me an email, uh, a.wise at andor.com. Um, but that's it for today. I will see hopefully everybody in a week at the same time uh, on the same platform. All right, thanks again for your attention. It's been great uh, talking to everybody today and have a good uh, rest of the weekend weekend.